this video, we're going to look more specifically at our SN1 mechanism. And remember that SN1 stood for substitution nucleophilic unimolecular. So these were our first order reactions, right? Only the alkyl halide is involved in the rate determining step. So RDS, rate determining step. So first order, Right, my rate law includes only the concentration of my alkyl halide. So only my alkyl halide affects the rate, right? My nucleophile does not affect the rate. We can change the nucleophile all we want. It's not going to speed up or slow down that reaction. So only the alkyl halide affects the rate. Right? Nucleophile is not part of the rate determining step. Looking more specifically at our mechanism, this mechanism takes place in two steps. The first step being my rate determining step. So we'll look at the stereochemistry of this one after. Right now I'm just going to look at my basic reaction steps. So in my first step, my leaving group is going to leave. So this is my slow step, right? This is my rate determining step. When we draw an energy diagram for this, this step is gonna have the larger activation energy as compared to the second step. We are going to go through a carbocation intermediate. That carbocation intermediate is planar, right? That carbon has one hydrogen on it, so it's sp2 hybridized, so it's flat. And we'll look at that when we look more specifically at the stereochemistry here coming up in a minute. And then in a next step, my nucleophile is going to add, right? That carbon is non-octet, right? It has a full positive charge on it. It's quite electrophilic. So my nucleophile is going to add to that carbon. And we're going to end up with my substituted product. Again, that second step being much faster than the first step because the first step is my rate determining step. So we're breaking our bond in one step, we're forming our bond in the next step, right? It's not concerted, right? It's not happening at the same time like my SN2 reaction does. I don't need to draw the transition states for these ones. Like I do ask for the SN2 mechanisms. I do have transition states, but I just, you don't need to draw them. So if you were to draw them for my rate determining step, right, my first step, I would have that bond between my partial positive carbon and my leaving group dotted because I'm breaking that bond. And then for the second mechanistic step, I would have a dotted line between that carbocation carbon and my nucleophile because I'm partially forming that bond. Again, you don't need to draw them for this. If you wanted to, you could. Just make sure if you do draw them, you draw them correctly. Um, I'm not asking that you do though. For the SN2, again, you do need to draw the transition state for full credit when showing those mechanisms. I do wanna look at the stereochemistry of this reaction. So 
So again, kind of the big difference between this and SN2 is this is going through a carbocation intermediate. So C plus for carbocation. So my nucleophile isn't adding to my sp3 hybridized carbon, right, like it is in an SN2 mechanism. What it's adding to is an sp2 hybridized carbocation intermediate. So kind of looking at that carbocation a little bit more, and I'm going to draw its plane just kind of in the coming in and out at us. So what I'm doing is I'm just going to look at it to CR3 with a positive charge, so just a generic version. Right. It is sp2 hybridized because it has three electron groups. And I'm going to draw one in the plane. I'm going to draw one coming out at us. And I'm going to draw one going back. So it is trigonal planar. Right. The way that I'm drawing it, I don't have any bonds going up. I don't have any bonds going down. So there's nothing blocking the top. There's also nothing blocking the bottom. I do have an empty p orbital on this. That p orbital is coming up and down. It's perpendicular to the plane of my carbocation, right? It's coming up and coming down, but again, it's empty. Remember, if something was sp2 hybridized, I do have an unhybridized p orbital, right? When we made those orbitals, Right, we took an S and we took two P's. So that's how I got my SP2, and then we're left with an empty P orbital. So I do have an unhybridized P orbital left over. But again, it's empty, right? I don't have any bonds up, I don't have any bonds down. I have nothing blocking the top, I have nothing blocking the bottom. Which means when the nucleophile adds, it can attack from either side. It can attack from the top with equal likelihood that it could attack from the bottom. If I wanted to draw my carbocation in the plane of my iPad here, right now there's nothing coming out at us, there's nothing going back behind, and my nucleophile can attack with equal likelihood from the front as from the back. When I was looking at SN2 reactions, because my leaving group was leaving at the same time that my nucleophile was adding, they had to happen opposite of each other. Here, I have it adding from something that's planar, and it can add from either side. So the nucleophile can add from either side of the planar carbocation intermediate. So again, if I'm looking at this first one that I drew, right, it can attack from the top or the bottom with equal likelihood. If I switch the orientation and look at this one, it can attack from the front or the back with equal likelihood, right? Because it's planar, it can attack from either side and it actually attacks from both sides. So if I have a chiral center, if my you know, reactant is chiral, I'm actually going to get a racemic product. I'm actually going to get both enantiomers. I'll get the one where my configuration is retained, and I'll also get the one where it's inverted because it can attack from either side. So if chiral, the configuration is both retained and inverted. And I said enantiomers initially, um, if you have two chiral centers, you actually would get a set of diastereomers because one chiral center wouldn't be affected. The other chiral center, it can attack from either side. So I would actually get a pair of diastereomers, not enantiomers. So if there's one chiral center, I get a mixture of enantiomers. If more than one, we could get diastereomers. So if one chiral center
get a mixture of enantiomers. Possibly, and usually, but there is a few exceptions, um, racemic. If you remember, racemic meant that I had 50% of one enantiomer and 50% of the other enantiomer. Meaning that the racemic mixture itself is achiral, right? Because half of it would be R, half of it would be S, and then that combination, right? My racemic mixture would be achiral. If I had something big blocking, like adjacent to it, blocking one side, then it is possible to not get 50-50. But for the most part, it's generally going to be racemic. Um, maybe it's better to change the word possibly to usually. Racemic. Again, racemic is a chiral because the two rotations are going to cancel each other out. So let's actually look at a mechanism where we consider our stereochemistry. So we'll look at this one, and then let's have our chlorine coming out at us. So figuring out my stereochemistry, I do have a hydrogen on there that's going back. This is my highest priority group, number two and number three. That is counterclockwise. My hydrogen's my lowest priority. It's going back, so we can just leave it as S. And then drawing my mechanism, my leaving group is gonna leave in my first step. And it's taking those electrons with it, right? So the electrons that were in that bond are going on to that chlorine. Chlorine had three lone pairs. It's going to have four once it has left. Right, And then that carbon, where that chlorine was bonded, is now electron poor because chlorine took those electrons, right? Remember, leaving groups are accepting that electron pair. So I have my carbocation intermediate. It's planar. So the nucleophile can attack from either side. There is a hydrogen on there, so the hydrogen is my third bond in the trigonal planar. So let's just use methoxide again as my nucleophile. And it's going to attack from either side. I just, I'm, I usually write the words it can attack from either side instead of trying to draw it. So I'm just going to draw the one arrow. But then when we draw the products, we'll want to make sure that we draw them both. So draw my products down here. I have the one where it attacked from the front. When it attacked from the front, that methoxy group is coming out at us. It can also attack from the back. So I also get the product where that methoxy group is going back. So I get both of those. If I give you something that's chiral to start with, make sure you show me both products for full credit when something is sp1 hybridized. Sorry, when something is an SN1 reaction. Wow, that was a terrible misspeak. Um, doing configuration, one, two, three, hydrogen is going back. So that's S. Here I have one, two, three. This time my hydrogen is coming forward because that methoxy group is going back. So I get S, but because my lowest priority group is coming out at us, I actually need to switch it to R. So what I'm getting here is a pair of enantiomers. Sometimes you'll actually see the products written with a plus or minus. So instead of drawing them both out, one with the wedge and one with the dash, you'll see it where it's drawn planar. 
and then there'll be a plus with a minus often in parentheses. And what that means is that you have both enantiomers. The plus is one light rotation, and then the minus is rotating light in the opposite direction. Right? Remember, enantiomers will always rotate light in opposite directions. So that's what that plus and the minus are standing for. They're standing for my opposite light rotations, right? It's optically active. Remember, it's chiral. So if you were to write it this way or see it this way, um, I'm fine with that. So just remember, you do have both of them. If I ask you to assign configuration, however, you need to show those wedges and dashes. You can do that. So this means I have both enantiomers. I tend to write them out with wedges and dashes. On tests and quizzes, though, you may see the plus minus. So just do be aware of that. Looking at an energy diagram for this one. This time we do have an intermediate. I have two steps. So we're going to see two activation energies, two transition states, and an intermediate. So again, energy is increasing on my y-axis. Reaction is proceeding on the x. And then we're going to start out. We're going to go up. We're going to dip down. We're going to come back up and then come down to my product. So my reactants, this here is my carbocation intermediate, and then my products. My first transition state, my second transition state, and then when you draw this, because my first step is my rate determining step, my first activation energy needs to be bigger than my second activation energy. Right? Remember, the larger the activation energy, the slower the reaction. Since my first step is the slowest step, right, it's my rate determining step, that first activation energy needs to be bigger than the second. So EA1 needs to be greater than EA2, right? My first step is my rate determining step. So that's important if I ask you to draw one of these. And then my overall energy change. Again, the book is using enthalpy change. I tend to use Gibbs free energy change just pay attention to if I'm saying if it's exothermic or endothermic, spontaneous or non-spontaneous, so you know whether to put a G or an H there. So again, I do have an intermediate. I have two steps, so two transition states, two activation energies. My first step is my slowest step, so it needs to have the larger activation energy. I do want to go through another mechanism with you. Often with SN1 reactions, we're using neutral nucleophiles. Remember we said that nucleophiles could be charged or they could be neutral. And often with an SN1 reaction, we're going to see neutral nucleophiles. So I do want to do another mechanism using a nucleophile that's neutral because there's an extra reaction step. It's actually going to be a three-step mechanism by the time that we are done. And most of them actually occur this way. So I do want to do one more. We will talk about SN2 versus SN1 in the next couple of videos. So given the set of conditions, we're going to predict is it going to undergo an SN1 or an SN2 mechanism. And neutral nucleophiles tend to prefer SN1 because they're not as strong. And SN1, the nucleophile doesn't matter, right? It's not part of my rate determining step. So just another example mechanism. So this is going to be with an uncharged nucleophile. So we'll do some stereochemistry here. So bromine, right? There's a hydrogen bonded to that carbon also, so it is chiral. And then the first step of my mechanism for SN1 is always going to just be my leaving group leaving. That's again my slow step. And I'm going to go through that planar carbocation intermediate. My nucleophile then can add from either side. It actually adds from both sides, just on separate molecules. Which is, I guess, why the word either is better. 
And this time I'm actually gonna use the alcohol instead of the ion. So we'll still have oxygen attached to my CH3, but I'm gonna have a hydrogen on there also. So it's still nucleophilic because I still have two lone pairs, but it's neutral because it doesn't have that formal negative charge. So an uncharged nucleophile. So it's gonna attack that carbocation from both sides. And I'm gonna wait to the end to draw the stereochemistry. So what we have at this point is that carbon is bonded to that oxygen, that oxygen's bonded to that methyl group, but it's still also bonded to that hydrogen, right? It's a covalent bond between oxygen and that hydrogen. So that hydrogen's still attached. I do have a lone pair there and a formal positive charge. So we now need to get rid of that hydrogen. This is the last step. If you have a neutral nucleophile, we're gonna have a deprotonation step. So we're gonna deprotonate this. Let's just say deprotonation step. And if I gave you a solvent, we could use that. If I gave you water, um, if you don't have that, usually I'll just use another one of my nucleophiles. So I'm gonna use another alcohol. I actually learned it with bromine. Um, let me show you how I learned it. And then I'll, we'll talk about why I don't do it this way very often. Right? I would have bromine taking that proton, and one of my products would be HBr. What do we not like about that? You have to think back to your 152 days. Yeah, HBr is a strong acid, right? It doesn't want, right? Bromine doesn't want, or bromide ions, I should say, doesn't want to take a proton, right? If I was to take HBr, and I was to dissociate it, right, ionize it, I get this, and I wouldn't do this, right? I wouldn't put an arrow in two directions because it's a strong acid. It's completely ionized in aqueous solution. I would have said that bromide ions are inert, right? If I gave you sodium bromide, we would say it's a neutral salt. So because bromide doesn't want to accept a proton, doing what I just did is kind of silly. Again, is how I learned it. If you look up these reactions on the internet or even in textbooks, you're likely to see that way. It's just not, it doesn't make sense to me. So I don't like to do it that way. So I'm just gonna use in this case, another um, alcohol molecule. If you had water, you could use that. You probably do have water. Um, it's probably not just 100% methanol in the solution. So water would work fine too but I'm just gonna use another one of these. So the CH3, that should be bonded to the carbon, not the hydrogens. So we're gonna take just the proton and then the electrons between the proton and that oxygen are gonna go onto oxygen. And then I am gonna show my stereochemistry here. So I have one where that methoxy group is coming forward and one where it's going back. And I'm actually getting that um, from this step. So here I would actually have two. I'd have one where it's coming forward and one where it's going back. I just, I'm not expecting you to have to draw that step of the mechanism twice. So even though at this point, I do already have the two stereoisomers, don't worry about having to draw it until the end, unless you want to draw it out there. Um, again, the other way we could draw it is I could draw it planar. If you're gonna do this plus and minus, then make sure you do it planar, otherwise it doesn't make sense. And then do the plus and minus. So either this or this. Again, the focus of this part where I was doing the mechanism again is that I have a neutral nucleophile. So we're gonna have this deprotonation step when we have a neutral nucleophile. That's kind of hard to see. Neutral nucleophile. The other thing that we wanna consider with SN1 mechanisms is that carbocation. 
So because we go through that carbocation intermediate, we do want to look at the stability of our carbocation. Carbocations can actually rearrange to form more stable carbocations. So first of all, we just want to look at the stability. So carbocations. So in general, the more carbons you have bonded to that non-octet carbon, right, my carbocation itself, the more stable it's going to be. So if I was to look at a methyl carbocation, that's going to be a carbon that just has hydrogens bonded to it. So methyl, a primary carbocation. So we're using the same sort of um, nomenclature that we did with primary alkyl halides, right? Remember the carbon that has the halogen attached to it's bonded to one other carbon, a primary carbocation intermediate is also going to have one carbon attached to that non-octet carbon. Secondary, I'm going to have two carbon-base groups. Again, my R group here is going to be a carbon-base group attached to that non-octet carbon, so secondary carbocation intermediate. And then tertiary is going to have three carbon-base groups attached to that carbon. And as I go in this direction, it's actually more stable. So the more carbon-based groups you have attached to that carbon, the more stable it is. There's a couple reasons for that um, that I'm not going to get into in this video, but do know that as we go from methyl to primary to secondary to tertiary, our carbocations do become more stable. We could have allelic and benzylic carbocations. So allelic, remember when we were talking about allelic halides, right? I would have had that bromine one carbon away. What we're doing here is adjacent to that double bond. I'm actually going to have my positive charge. So on carbon, one carbon away from that double bond, I have a positive charge. Benzylic, that's where we had the benzene ring. And then I had a carbon, if it was alkyl halide, I would have a halogen bonded to it. Since I'm talking about a benzylic carbocation intermediate, that halogen's left, right? My leaving group's left, and I have that. Um, this bond doesn't have to be here. I got rid of the bromine, but not the bond. It might be less confusing. Oops, if I get rid of the bond also. <laughs> so carbon there. And the reason these guys are stable is they have resonance. Right? Allelic and benzylic carbocation intermediates are resonant stabilized. So both of these would have resonance structures. Right? Those are equivalent. They would both contribute equally to the hybrid, but it does have resonance. Right? Those electrons, instead of sitting in one spot, are delocalized de throughout that entire system. Right? So these ones are resonance stabilized. So they're pretty stable. Right, we could draw a whole bunch of resonance structures for my benzylic one. I'm not going to draw all of them, but there's quite a few we could draw. Right, I have that, and then I can just keep moving those electrons around the ring and draw more resonance structures. So. As we go in this direction, it becomes more stable. Tertiary and secondary um, carbocation intermediates are, are fairly stable. They're still intermediates, right? They're still non-octet, right? They're not nearly as low as energy as my reactants or my products, but they're not horrible, right? They exist. Methyl ones and primary ones, we're just really not going to even form those. They're just too unstable um, to really form an intermediate. And then allelic carbocations and benzylic carbocations, because they have resonance, they're also relatively stable. So carbocations, like everything, right? If we can make them more stable, we're going to. And carbocations can rearrange. So carbocation rearrangements. 
we're essentially going to have like an intramolecular step where I take it and we make it better. So carbocation rearrangements. So if we can form a carbocation that's more stable, we're going to do that. So carbocations can rearrange. If a more stable carbocation is possible, it will undergo a rearrangement. And we always want to consider this whenever we have a carbocation intermediate. So anytime we have an SN1 reaction, we're going to form a carbocation. Anytime we can form a carbocation, we want to look and see, can it rearrange? If it can rearrange, it will rearrange. So we always need to consider rearrangements when looking at SN1 reactions. And then later on in the semester, we're going to have reactions where I have carbocation intermediates um, that are not SN1 reactions, but still involve a carbocation, we're going to have to look for rearrangements. So anytime you form a carbocation, look for rearrangements. So if a more stable carbocation is possible, it will undergo a rearrangement to form that more stable one. So kind of as a something you want to lock into your head, <laughs> if you form a carbocation, Look for possible rearrangements. With SN2 reactions, I'm not forming an intermediate, so I don't need to worry about it. But with SN1 reactions, remember I do go through that intermediate, that carbocation intermediate. So we need to look for rearrangements. So what do these look like? Our most common type of rearrangement is called a hydride shift. So hydride is a hydrogen with a negative charge, right? So hydrogen like this, right? Remember bromine becomes bromide, right? When it's an anion, fluorine becomes fluoride, sulfur, sulfide, hydrogen becomes hydride. So hydride is my hydrogen with a lone pair of electrons. So a hydride shift. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be moving hydrogens and they're going to take the electrons with them when they move. So instead of moving a proton, right, that's the hydrogen without the electrons, we're going to be moving hydrogen with the electrons. So a hydride shift. So kind of an example is how we would get that. I'm going to have this halogen and then next door to it, I'm going to put a methyl group. So this first step isn't the hydride shift. This is just the first step of my SN1 mechanism. So my leaving group leaves, right? And then we end up with this intermediate. And then this is where I'm going to stop and I'm going to look, okay, can I make this carbocation more stable? If I can, we're going to do that. Right now, it's a secondary carbocation, right? That carbon, that positive charge is on is bonded to two other carbons, right? It's bonded to this carbon and this carbon and a hydrogen. So it's a secondary carbocation intermediate. However, if I was to put that positive charge, if I could put that positive charge on that adjacent carbon, it would be tertiary, right? If I could do this, that would be a tertiary carbocation tertiary is more stable than secondary, we want it to be as stable as possible. So since adjacent to it, right, I have that methyl group, we're going to do an, a rearrangement. So what's going to happen, and I'm going to draw the hydrogen out, there is a hydrogen here. And what we're going to do is we're going to move that hydrogen with its electrons over to that positive charge. So be careful with the arrow, it's not this that's moving, right? It's not just the hydrogen, it's taking those electrons. So those electrons in the bond with its hydrogen are gonna move over to that carbon. I'm going through a transition state and you don't have to draw this, I just kinda want you to see what's going on. Um, so this is what I had before. I have this hydrogen, it had this bond, right? 
So what we're going to do is we're going to end up breaking that bond. So that's going to be dotted. And then I'm forming this bond. And it's kind of just happening at the same time. So this would be my transition state. We can only do this hydride shift on adjacent carbons. So it has to be next door. We can't go like two carbons down. I can't do a transition state that looks like this. This is why I wanted to show you the transition state um, if it's too far away. So it does have to be adjacent. If it's not adjacent, we can't do it. So once I do that hydride shift, right, I'm moving the hydrogen my positive charge is now going to be here. So if we look, it looks like I'm moving the positive charge and I'm not. Positive charges don't move, right? The positive charge comes from my formal charge calculation. I'm just moving that over because it's gonna be in my way. <laughs> so I'm just moving it slightly. I do have one hydrogen on this carbon, right? So when I do my formal charge calculation, four, right, the number of valence electrons for carbon. I'm going to subtract from that one, two, three. So four minus three is a plus one. I have a positive charge on that carbon. Once I move that hydrogen over, I now have two hydrogens on this carbon. So when I do my formal charge calculation, four again, but this time I'm going to subtract one, two, three, four. So I don't have a charge on that. A lot of times when folks are drawing arrows, they're like showing the positive charge moving. Positive charge, right? My charge is a function of the number of bonds and lone pairs that it has. So don't be moving charge, right? We're moving electrons, which I know are charge, but don't just move the, the symbol for the positive charge, right? The reason there's a charge symbol there is because it has um, a very different amount of electrons. Right, so don't move plus and minuses, right? Move our actual electrons. If I do the formal charge calculation for this one now, I don't have a hydrogen there because we moved it, right? That hydrogen's no longer attached to that carbon because we moved it over to the other carbon. So now when I do my formal charge calculation, I'm gonna have four minus one, oops, <laughs> minus one, two, three, my positive charge is there. So again, what I'm doing is I'm taking that hydrogen I'm taking the electrons that are attached to that hydrogen and we're moving it to the adjacent carbon. So hydride shift. So this part was the hydride shift. I now have a tertiary carbocation intermediate. So now in my nucleophile, we'll just use NU for nucleophile. My nucleophile adds, it's still planar, so it can add from either side. I'm actually going to get this as my product. It's not chiral, so I don't need to worry about the plus minus, right? I have two methyl groups attached to that carbon, but that's what I get. And it can be kind of confusing. It, like if we didn't go through the mechanism, right? If we just drew the reaction, I have my halogen attached to my second carbon from the right. And then when I'm done with my reaction, right after my mechanism, I have my nucleophile attached to a different carbon. And it looks like, okay, that's not possible, but it is because my carbocation rearranged. So again, be careful. Anytime you go through a carbocation, look for rearrangements. If you can make it more stable, we're going to do that. One way to make it more stable is to do our hydride shift. And that's where we're moving the electrons bonded to a hydrogen to an adjacent carbon. This is only with adjacent carbons. I can't move it a couple carbons down, so it has to be right next door. Another type of carbocation rearrangement is an alkyl shift, and these ones are a lot more rare. Usually we're gonna see a hydride shift, but we could have an alkyl shift. And that's where we're moving an alkyl group. So this one's pretty specific, and I'm just going to go right to my carbocation instead of drawing the alkyl halide and having it leave. So we're just jumping right to the intermediate. But I would have to have a quaternary carbon next door. So a carbon that has 
um, three R groups attached to it in addition to what, you know, the attachment to the carbocation. So I have this attachment and then one, two, three. So quaternary, there's four things total attached there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to move the entire alkyl group. So since they're all methyl groups, it doesn't matter which one, but I'm going to take the CH3 group and its electrons and I'm going to move it over. And again, this has to be adjacent, right? This was a secondary carbocation. When I do that, try to draw it so it makes a little more sense here. So this carbon here is going to be the carbon that had the positive charge. And then it now has an extra methyl group on it. It had a hydrogen, so that hydrogen is still there, so no charge. This carbon here did not have a hydrogen. It now only has two other groups to it, so three electron groups. So it now has the positive charge. So I went from a secondary carbocation to a tertiary carbocation. Again, that only works when we have a quaternary carbon or quaternary four degree carbon next door. Let me try to make it legible for you. <laughs> quaternary carbon. adjacent to the carbocation. So again, just watch out for these. If you can make your carbocation more stable, we're going to do that. One way of doing it is a hydride shift. That's gonna be the more common way you're gonna see it. Another way is an alkyl shift, much less carb common. Um, and then you can also have resonance, watch out for that, right? If I have something that's allelic or benzelic, we could have resonance also. So if this was, right, my carbyl cation, it could have resonance and in this case I'm not actually making it more stable but it is possible Right? If something has resonance, it's going to have resonance, right? It's delocalized. Remember, in resonance structures, neither one of those exists. They're both correct. So we could actually get products from this where I have my nucleophile on this carbon, but then I also have my nucleophile on... Oops, I just lost a carbon. On this carbon also. So just be careful. Both of those are possible products because of that resonance. So watch out for rearrangements, watch out for resonance whenever you have a carbocation intermediate.